Tejo wari medam yata vini mayo yata tri sargo mesha Dam nasvena sada nirasta kuha kam satyam param di mahi O oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, O oh, all pervading personality Godhead, offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause behind him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. <clears throat> Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by reaction to the three modes of nature. No, the modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitrovocha Paramo Nimatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapachayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Kute Kim Vapare Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avurudhite Tra Kriti Bihi Susu Subhistakshana completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Sukumakad Amrita Dravya Samyutam Bibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam Mohor Ahoraska Bhuvi Bhavukaha O expert and thoughtful man, relish Shimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Pidyantak Stohi Badrani Vidyanati Suhitsatam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend, 
and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu bhadesu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati islam tu tamas loke bhakti bhavati naistiki in this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the transcendental and he becomes fixed in the devotional service to the Lord. Kamalo Badayas Chaye Chete Taranavidam Sifam Satve Prasidati By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance, and thus material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam Prasana Manaso Bhagavat Bhakti Yogataha Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangha Sijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. He becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante chasya sar chidyante sarvasam saya siyante chasya karmani just the evat manishwari thus bhakti yoga serves the hard knot of material affection and enables one and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 6. Atavasya Padamboja Makaranda Liham Satam Kim Anyar Asad Ala Puer Ayusoyad Asad Vyaya Translation The devotees of the Lord are accustomed to licking up the honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. What is the use of topics which simply waste one's valuable life? Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Lord Krishna and his devotees are both on the transcendental plane. Therefore, the topics of Lord Krishna and his pure devotees are equally good. The battle of Kurukshetra is full of politics and diplomacy, but because the topics are related with Lord Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita is therefore adored all over the world. There is no need to eradicate politics, economics, sociology, etc., which are mundane to the mundaners. To a pure devotee who is actually related with Krishna, such mundane things are transcendental if dovetailed with the Lord or with his pure devotees. We have heard and talked about the activities of the Pandavas, and we now are dealing with the topics of Maharaj Brikshit. But because all these topics are related to Lord Sri Krishna, they are all transcendental, and pure devotees have great interest in hearing them. We have already discussed the matter in connection with the prayers of Bhisma Deva. Our duration of life is not very long, and there is no certainty of when we shall be ordered to leave everything for the next stage. Thus, it is our duty to see that not a moment of our life is wasted in topics which are not related to Lord Krishna. Any topic, however pleasant, is not worth hearing if it is devoid of its relation to Krishna. 
The spiritual planet, Goloka Vrindavana, the eternal abode of Lord Krishna, is shaped like the whorl of a lotus. Even when the Lord descends to any one of the mundane planets, he does so by manifesting his own abode as it is. Thus his feet remain always on the same whorl of the lotus flower. His feet are also beautiful as the lotus flower. Therefore it is said that Lord Krishna has lotus feet. A living being is eternal by constitution. He is, so to speak, in the whirlpool of birth and death due to his contact with material energy. Freed from such material energy, a living entity is liberated and is eligible to return home back to Godhead. Those who want to live forever without changing their material bodies should not waste valuable time with topics other than those relating to Lord Krishna and his devotees. Srila Prabhupada Ki So we can tell who is a devotee and who is not a devotee by symptoms. And what is, what, are, what is one of the symptoms that is defining a devotee? Machita matkata prana kodiyantas parasparam kodiyantas chanam nidyan tushyanticha ramanticha the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their, their lives are fully devoted to my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about me. So, this is a very important verse. It explains one of the essential qualities of a devotee. That's also spoken of in, in this the verse that we studied today from the Bhagavatam. And the purport Prabhupada says, Pure devotees, whose characteristics are mentioned here, engage themselves fully in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Their minds cannot be diverted from the lotus feet of Krishna. Their talks are solely on the transcendental subjects. The symptoms of the pure devotees are described in this verse specifically. Devotees of the Supreme Lord are 24 hours daily engaged in glorifying the qualities pastimes and pastimes of the Supreme Lord. Their hearts and souls are constantly submerged in Krishna, and they take pleasure in discussing him with other devotees. In the preliminary stage of devotional service, they relish the transcendental pleasures, the transcendental pleasure from the service itself. And in the mature stage, they are actually situated in love of God. Once situated, in that transcendental position, they can relish the highest perfection which is exhibited by the Lord in his abode. Lord Chaitanya likens transcendental devotional service to the sowing of seed in the heart of the living entity. There are innumerable living entities traveling throughout the different planets of the universe, and out of them there are a few who are fortunate enough to meet a pure devotee and get the chance to understand devotional service. This devotional service is just like a seed and if it is sown in the heart of a living entity, and if he goes on hearing and chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, that seed fructifies just as the seed of a tree fructifies with regular hearing. The spiritual plant of devotional service gradually grows and grows until it penetrates the covering of the material universe and enters into the Brahma Jyoti effulgence in the spiritual sky. In the spiritual sky also this plant grows more and more until it reaches the highest planet which is called Goloka, Vrindavana, the supreme planet of Krishna. Ultimately, the plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna and rests there. Gradually, as a plant grows fruits and flowers, uh, the, that plant of devotional service also produces fruits, and the watering process in the form of chanting and hearing goes on. This plant of devotional service is fully described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulita chapter 19. It is explained there that when the complete plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, one becomes fully absorbed in love of God, a love of God. Then he cannot live even for a moment without being in constant, in contact with the Supreme Lord. Just as a fish cannot live without water, in such a state, the devotee actually attains 
the transcendental qualities in contact with the Supreme Lord. The Srimad Bhagavatam is also full of such narrations about the relationship between the Supreme Lord and his devotees. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam is very dear to the devotees, as stated in the Bhagavatam 12, 13, 18. Srimad Bhagavatam Puranam Amalam Amalam Yad Vaishnavanam Priyam. In this narration, there is nothing about material activities, economic development, sense gratification, or liberation. Srimad Bhagavatam is the only narration in which the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord and his devotees is fully described. Thus, the realized souls in Krishna consciousness take continual pleasure in hearing such transcendental literatures just as a young boy and girl take pleasure in association. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Well, this is, these are the essential qualities of a devotee, this hearing and chanting, the glories of the Lord. And uh, it's a rare thing that someone actually develops this culture of constantly hearing and chanting about Krishna. Most people are hearing and chanting about mundane people and mundane achievements and mundane goals and mundane subjects and mundane philosophy and mundane everything. But the devotee is concerned with transcendental life. With, and there's no mundaneness in transcendental life. It's all connected to Krishna. It's all full of nectar. It's all full of significant uh, let's say, uh, ideas and concepts that are bona fide and eternally true. That's the particular quality of the subject matter of Krishna consciousness. Things are eternally true. Therefore, one is never deceived, one is never discouraged, one is never unhappy because they have eternal truth, eternal beauty, eternal uh, pastimes, etc. So here it says that uh, the devotees of the Lord are accustomed to licking up the honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. Well, I don't think anyone would lick honey off of somebody's feet in the material world. But uh, well, maybe there are some people that do that, but Licking the honey from the lotus tree to the Lord is especially uh, transcendental. In fact, it says that there are bees always around the lotus tree to the Lord because they're licking that honey. And the devotees also, uh, by being surrendered to the Lord, just like we come to the temple and we bow our head all the way down to the ground uh, and offer our uh, dandabhats uh, at the lotus tree to the Lord. So that is our natural position. Just like it says in Rig Veda, uh, that uh, the uh, demigods are always uh, surrendered at the lotus feet of the Lord. They take shelter there. Their, their ashraya, their refuge, are the lotus feet of the Lord. So uh, we should uh, humble ourselves so much that we have no other interest than to please Krishna and, and Guru and always keep our mind focused on the transcendental qualities of the Lord. The transcendental qualities of the Lord are infinite. There's no end to them. Therefore, there's no exhaustion or uh, boredom in spiritual life. If one is really concerned about learning more and more about Krishna consciousness, it's exciting. It's like, uh, Prabhupada gives the example of Napoleon. Napoleon could hardly sleep at night. He was so excited about conquering countries, you see. And the Goswamis, they really didn't sleep hardly at all because they were excited, not about conquering countries, but about glorifying the Lord and, and uh, meditating on the Lord's transcendental pastimes. So there's different types of excitement in life. But when you taste the honey and the, uh, or the nectar at the lotus feet of the Lord and are always thinking about his transcendental pastimes and being inspired by them, 
then you're excited. You, you don't even want to sleep. You just want to continually hear and, and discuss and glorify Krishna, who's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So how is it that some people, even very brilliant people, think that God is not a person? Like, for example, our, the class I have now, the kids there, uh, studying uh, the uh, statements made by Einstein about his uh, understanding of religion and philosophy. And he did not, he was convinced that God is not a person. He was convinced that the soul and the body are one. There's no difference between the soul and the body. And he was convinced that there's no afterlife. When you die, that's it. It's all done. And, uh, but yet, if people said that he was an atheist, he would, he would uh, vehemently object. He said, I'm not an atheist. I believe in causality. I believe that there is mystery in nature. And as a scientist, I'm trying to discover, but whatever I've discovered, only a little part of that mystery. And I, and I, I meditate on the order of the universe and how it's functioning in such an incredible way. So if, if there is a God, uh, my God is this impersonal uh, concept of the marvelous functioning of the universe. Okay, so he has some idea of God. But his idea is very far from the truth. It's only very, very partial understanding. Although he's considered one of the smartest people that's ever lived. Actually, he's not that smart. Uh, well, he, all he's doing is discovering things that already exist, that are already functioning perfectly, and, and uh, functioning in a way that he, he's hardly able to understand. And he, he admits it. He admits it in his writing. Uh, actually, uh, anyone who has a rational mind can understand. Like, for example, in order to put uh, a Sputnik, the first Sputnik in the 1950s, uh, it required a huge amount of money, the cooperation of many different agencies in the Soviet Union, uh, and hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. It's thousands of people if you count the technicians, the scientists, the politicians, and so forth, and bankers. They all had to work together to get this thing up into the air before the United States. They beat the United States in putting a, a satellite. It's not a natural satellite. The natural satellite are the planets and the stars. This was an artificial satellite. It only weighed... Uh, a few hundred pounds. It only lasted for about 22 days. And it required a huge effort. So if we compare the natural satellites to the artificial satellites, like we can fast forward till today, we have the, uh, the uh, space station, which is a lot bigger than the original Sputnik. It's as big as a football field. But what is that compared to the planets, right? And it's, it has solar panels. So it's deriving its energy from the sun, you know, electromagnetic waves and so forth. And there are uh, about uh, uh, 80 miles of electric wire in it, right? And there's so much, you know, metals and and plastics, and, and it was all put together by intelligent people. And it's only between 200 to 400 miles from the surface of the Earth. So, and it's taken a huge effort, and there's only maybe 10 people in it. And uh, it's been going on now for since uh, for about, uh, I think, almost 20 years. So, uh, so many miles of electric wires, so many uh, uh, lines of computer programming. There's, there's uh, over 8 million lines of computer programming. 
So it has, has taken thousands of people. It has the co cooperation of 15 different countries. It's cost $150 billion to keep it in the air for 20 years, right? <laughs> Look at all that effort and all those people involved in it. And it's nothing compared to the planets. It's, and, and the planets, to keep them in the air, there are no wires. There are no computer lines. There are no, you, you, they, have, they have like, I think, just in the American part of the uh, space station, there's 50 computers all working 24 hours a day to keep that thing in the air, right? So uh, by comparison, you can see that whatever human beings are doing in space, let's say, exploration and travel, it's childish, it's negligent, it's, it's nothing compared to what's, what's already there. And how is it there? There's no wires. I mean, they go to the moon. They don't see any wires. They go to Mars. They're not going to see any wires. They're not going to see any computers. And so how, is it, how are those planets kept perfectly in orbit for millions and millions of years? In fact, our watches are calibrated according to the movement of uh, the sun, right? In other words, we have to correct our watches once or twice a year you know, because the time is being kept by the sun's movement. So, so you see, what do they know actually about the universe? They know almost nothing. In fact, only two people have said this clearly. One is Newton and the other is Einstein. Newton said, we have only understood a few grains in the vast ocean of knowledge. Well, you know how big the ocean is, right? And how much sand is there in the ocean? And he said, we've only understood a few grains. And, so, and, and uh, Einstein gave the example of a little kid who walks into a gigantic library with books stacked up on shelves to a very high ceiling and all around. And he sees the books, and the books are in different languages. He doesn't understand anything, but he sees, and then it's all organized, though. And all he can understand is this amazing organization that he doesn't understand. He said, this is our scientific understanding of the universe. So Newton and Einstein both uh, made it very clear that they didn't understand really what's going on in the universe. They've understood a few little things, but they're convinced, both of them, that the universe is functioning a cause because of laws and causality, right? They both know that. That's why, see, if, if, if the universe was not functioning in a systematic way, in an orderly way, there's no question of science. If it was all uh, chaotic, you, you wouldn't be able to predict anything. There would be no laws governing it. But they see that there are laws governing the movements of the planets, and these are gigantic planets, and the source of power of all of it is the sun. And one sun is, is uh, heating up and sending energy all over the universe, right? And they have no way of comprehending how this happened, and where all this matter came from, and how the, the, the planets are being held perfectly in orbits, right? So, uh, Therefore, Einstein's understanding of God is less than his understanding of nature. <laughs> In other words, he's got all the wrong conclusions, and he's the most brilliant man in modern times, you see. So this is what our kids should be studying. They should be able to understand that these people, these, the greatest of the great, have really very little knowledge. Because real knowledge is knowledge of Krishna. And without that knowledge, everything else is, is basically a waste of time. Because it will not save you at the moment of death. Einstein actually believed that there's no after death. That when you die, it's all over. And that body and the soul are the same thing. And that God is not a person. He, he said he cannot be a person. Now, why did he say that? Because he read the Bible. He was... He was born in a Jewish family. He read the Bible. He went to a Catholic school, by the way. And he actually used to enjoy the Catholic school and the stories they would tell from the Bible. But when he became 12 years old, he started reading science books. 
and the science books that he read convinced him that there's no God and that the stories of the Bible are all fables or, or made up stories and, uh, and that the God of the Bible is a mean God. He's a God of punishment and reward. He said, how can he be like that? You know? and, and he's someone who makes a mistake and he destroys the whole world. And then it starts it all over again, and regretting that he destroyed it. So, to him, he said, these are just childish fables, stories that have no factual uh, content. So what's important is, once he started reading science books from 12 years old, he gave up believing in organized religion, uh, Judaism, Catholicism, all that. And the uh, rest of his life, he was convinced that there's, there's no personal God and so forth. What are our kids studying today? Science books. They're studying science. And science is definitely, uh, there's a very famous scientist, uh, I mean, mathematician, his name was Godel. He and he and Einstein were very close friends in Princeton. They both were uh, professors in Princeton University. And Godel and, and Einstein used to discuss all the time uh, many different questions, not only mathematic, mathematics, but they would talk about God also. So Godel was just as brilliant as Einstein, but not as famous, but just as brilliant as him. And he came up with things that uh, uh, match Einstein's, uh, let's say, scientific discoveries. Right? I'm not going to discuss that now. But one thing he did was, before he died, I mean, he was a brilliant, brilliant mathematician. He gave a mathematical proof that God exists. But he didn't publish it. He only shared it with a few friends. It was only published after he died. And his friends explained why. He said he was afraid that if he published this before he died, then all his colleagues would reject him because he believed in God. You see? There's fear. There's actual fear on these higher echelons of publicly stating that you believe in God because you'll be rejected by all the other scientists, or most of them. But Godel was, a, was as brilliant, or if not more brilliant, than, than Einstein. So, I mean, this is what our kids are, uh, in, in this class I have, this is what they're studying. This is much more important than anything they learn in school. In school, they, they learn not to, not to, in any way, challenge the scientists, challenge the atheists. They just, they're scared into silence. Because if you say anything, they all jump on you, including the teachers. Okay, Okor is a seal of Prabhupada Kijay. Are there any questions? What? Said no. Wait a minute. You need a microphone. People complain that they can't hear the questions. We're getting let, uh, emails now. They're complaining. They want to hear the questions. Okay, if you're going to ask a question, come up here. You can use this microphone until he figures out. Well, let's put it out so they can use it. We can speak in this. Is that one on? No, it's not. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. So What's your question? In, the, in, the, in this paragraph, it says, "Is feet are speak all, into the microphone?" Is feet are also as beautiful as lotus flower? Therefore, it is said that Lord Krishna has lotus feet. Can you uh, elaborate a bit more on why we only I mean? I understand the lotus feet, but is there any more uh, significance or more uh, meaning around the lotus feet uh, aspects? Well, uh, 
Om Tat Vishnu Paramam Padam Sadapasyanti Surayo Divivai Chaksad Atatam Tat Vipanyo Vipanyava. So this this is a Rig Veda and it says that uh, all the demigods are assembled or their aim in life is are the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. So what does that mean? That means there's ashraya. Ashraya means you take shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. And, and this is the number one qualification uh, for a devotee's humility. Right? Why is it that people challenge the existence of God? Because they're puffed up. Because they have money or because they have uh, some uh, special qualities like uh, being a scientist or being a mathematician. Uh, so they get puffed up by material acquisitions. And therefore they cannot accept that there's someone greater than them. So the beginning of knowledge, amanitvam, is humility. It's the number one uh, point. Amanitvam, adamitvam, ahimsa santarajavam, acharya pasamam, socham, staryamatvam, vinigraha. Humility, pridelessness, false pridelessness, and nonviolence. Ahimsa, shantir, forgiveness and tolerance. Arjavam, honesty and simplicity. And Acharya Pasama, accepting a bona fide spiritual master. So you, you need those first four or five things in order to surrender to the spiritual master, right? Otherwise you won't. And then Socham, cleanliness, internally and external cleanliness. Acharya Pasama Socham, Staryam Atma Vinigraha. So Staryam means steadiness. Atma Vinigraha means you control the senses and the mind. So these are preliminary qualifications to be a devotee. And number one is humility. So Therefore, one surrenders at the feet of the Lord. One humbles themselves. Just like we come into the temple, we pay our obeisances. Right? We're humbling ourselves at the feet of the, of the Lord. And at the feet of the Lord, there's nectar. There's actually, because when you surrender to the Lord, what happens? You overcome the influence of Maya, by surrendering at the lotus feet. So that is nectar. You feel freedom. You're free of the influence of the modes of nature. And therefore, there's no more sochati and kunksati, lamentation and hankering, material hankering. Material desires are like pins in the body. You know, uh, the, the acupuncturist puts pins in the body to relieve pain. But Maya puts pins in the body to cause pain, right? So uh, those, those hankerings, I want this, I want that. I didn't get this. I'm frustrated. I'm not happy with this person, this thing, that thing. You know, my stock went down. Uh, Trump is making me crazy. The, you know, the people are going crazy with hankerings. But now the devotee becomes free of, of lamentation and hankerings and he sees a, everyone with an equal eye. And he sees that everyone is like a walking, everyone, not only human beings, the animals, the plants, as walking or talking or stationary temples because Krishna is present in the heart of every living entity. So you have this, uh, this equal vision and neutrality. You're not disturbed by anything either happiness or distress, honor or dishonor. So that is a very desirable position to, to attain, you see. And that's because we humble ourselves at the feet of the Lord. And that's where the nectar is. People are looking nectar for nectar in other places, but that's where the nectar is, at the lotus feet of the Lord. Om Tat Vishnu Paramam Padam Sadapasyanti Surayo Diviva Chaksuratatam Tat Vipasna Vipanyava Jagavam Sasamindante Vishnu 
that put them on. So let me see what this. Uh, um, oh boy, it's not in here. Oh yes, it is. Okay. So this is a very important verse in the Rig Veda. And it says, just as the sun's rays in the sky are in, extended to the mundane vision, so in the same way, the wise and learned devotees always see the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu, because those highly praiseworthy and spiritually awake brahmanas are able to see the spiritual world they are also able to reveal that supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. Okay, so that's one translation. There's an alternate translation. The lotus feet of Lord Vishnu are the supreme object of all the demigods. That's the one we usually cite. Those lotus feet of the Lord are as enlightening as the sun in the sky. Okay? Or another translation, the personality of God at Vishnu is the absolute truth whose lotus feet the demigods are always eager to see. Like the sun god, he pervades everything by the rays of his energy. He appears impersonal to imperfect eyes. So this verse in the Rig Veda, uh, it is one, first chapter, 20 sec, no, first canto chapter 22, verse 20, is extremely important because it shows that the real let's say, abode, or what their people are, the, the demigods are striving for, are the lotus feet of the Lord Vishnu. Right? So that's where you find shelter, that's where you taste nectar of immortality. Yeah. Honey ball. Yeah. So, Speak close to the microphone. Yeah. yeah uh, the significance of the lotus feet compared of the low compared to the largest is that the <coughs> like the lotus grows from the water but never touched by the water. So when <coughs> we take shelter of lotus feet of Krishna, we be, we never be become contaminated by the material energy. It's the only way to to become, you know, to be protected from uh, material contamination when we constantly attach the lotus with the Lord, because like lotus never uh, touched by the war. And uh, it is very little poetic that, you know, that lotus gives shelter to a bee. It is said that the bee sometimes, by to look for uh, looking for honey, they go to one type of flower called Kitaki flower, and that flower very thorny, like rose. But while going there, the wing gets pierced by those uh, thorns, right. and it gets so much pain. But then the alternative for shelter, the bee to go to the lotus, which open and gets in there, and again, the tap of honey, that from the honey, honey from the lotus is the best type of honey. It is compared like immortal honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it cures all the diseases. <laughs> so the bee, the, the bee goes there and uh, enter into the lotus flower, and then gets sheltered. The, the lotus flower gives shelter there, and the, the bee is really, really peaceful, happy, with wonderful type of honey, sucking the honey, and there's no thorns there. And, and then once again, when the, the lotus close, the petals close, and give shelter to the, uh, to the bee inside. The bee remains there. So uh, that this, this is another uh, significance of why the lotus with the lord compared to lotus. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Good. Very good. Right. Any other questions? Haribo, of course, Sila Prabhupada.